Hi, welcome to today's webinar about building a scalable SaaS on AWS. Thanks for coming. And so we've chosen this topic in particular because we've been through this process with our clients many times before, and we know how complicated it can often get. And so that's why we wanted to shed some light on lesser known aspects of this topic. My name is Laura, I'm in charge of marketing, and I'll just give you a short intro to what we're all about. So thank you for joining us and let's get straight to it. Labyrinth Labs is a one-stop shop for DevOps, Cloud and Kubernetes, and we're also an advanced consulting partner of AWS. We primarily focus on growing startups, uh, migration to AWS for scale-up, ISVs moving their solution to a SaaS offering, which we like to refer to as SaaSification. You'll heard this term many times during this webinar, so just your uh, just so you are aware of what it means, uh, Martin will explain it a little bit into deep as well. And for the other SaaS and software builders uh, who already are on AWS, we also offer infrastructure modernization and optimization, especially in terms of security, performance, and costs. So our mission is transforming businesses to become cloud native and future ready. And over the years, we've helped many of our customers uh, with building or optimizing their cloud infrastructure. So they have and kind of enabling them to grow and innovate while building them a solid foundation where they can run their services. And so today's uh, webinar, uh, will give you an introduction to building a cloud platform as a greenfield project versus certification, and then we'll move to three use cases where we'll talk about our experience with uh, fully full tenant isolation, partial multi pool based infrastructure, and at the end we'll uh, summarize everything and give you all the main takeaways. And also we'll have some time for a Q and A session. And so today with us, we have our senior DevOps engineer, Jaroslav Wojciech and Martin Hauskerecht, who will go into uh, more details of this topic. And if you have any questions, please sign them down to through our Slido. We'll get to them at the end. And also as a little motivator for you to, uh, to ask the questions, the one that will have the most upvotes, I'll reach out to the person and we'll send you some cool merchandise pack. So without further ado, I give my word to Martin and uh, yes. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, today we want to talk more about building a scalable SaaS solution on AWS and some different approaches to it, some real life cases and give you an overview of how one could build uh, a SaaS and take, uh, tackle this challenge and how we call it SaaSify their product. Uh, let's start with some basics. Uh, building a SaaS solution can mean different things and everybody has a different view about the topic. For some, uh, it can mean building a new Greenfield project without any previous restrictions and starting an, basically starting a new line of product. Uh, and people and companies in this case have a lot of flexibility. Uh, usually they do not have too many restrictions coming from some historical setup and uh, th those setups usually have a, a pile of technical depth. Uh, the other case uh, is when a company already has a uh, software product which is not uh, yet running as a SaaS solution. Usually it is sold in a more traditional like licensed software way uh, or as an over-the-counter solution. And making a SaaS product from making a SaaS from a product like that can pose many challenges for that company. Uh, an operation like that requires a lot of human power in the form of developers some other personnel which needs to make major changes to the existing software and this often comes with a lack of previous experience and knowledge about such a transformation not to speak about a lot of technical depth which is which it usually brings along uh, there are a lot of topics to talk about uh, such as how to handle the tenant life cycle and the data uh, how and in what extent to isolate the tenant data and how to keep the costs of such a solution down and today uh, we'll show you three real life cases of companies which uh, undertook this challenge. And I'll let my colleague Yaro to tell you more about the first one. 
Thank you, Martin. Hi, everyone. So let's let's check for our first case where we will talk about the fully isolated tenants. So first, um, I will describe the solution of our client and the client circumstances during which uh, he decided to make a SaaS offering for uh, its pro his product. And um, uh, so briefly, this this solution or this product is GRC solution. GRC means for government's recent compliance activities. And this solution was uh, previously mainly offered by our clients to its end and you and customers uh, via traditional license model and uh, the way how the software or the solution was delivered to the end clients was uh, primarily like on-premise installation directly in the client environment so um, what is important here to mention is that this client uh had which had this solution that was trying to sell this solution had quite a small size business uh, it has around 100 customers spread over the globe and it's a small size company with a few developers behind which were developing operating maintaining upgrading and delivering this software product to the end customers the the important thing here here is that this application was running for the clients for several years and they developed the solution which didn't have any multi-tenancy capabilities on the application level so uh now we can discuss what was what what were the main challenges here we were we were faced during the building the software offering SaaS offering for them so First of all, they had a requirement to enter backward compatibility for their software. This means that they wanted to have still possibility to sell this product in the old fashioned way, like a license uh, package uh, software. And on the other hand, they wanted to sell this product and offer this product as a SaaS offering. The second requirement, which um, the client had for us was that um, as far as this solution is GRC solution uh, and the and clients often put very sensitive data into this software um, there is uh, very often the regulation behind which forced them to store the data in the specific geolocation so the cost the client had to have the ability ability to uh, onboard the tenant to the specific region within the infrastructure. The another very main topic here is that they they were under quite a big pressure and they wanted to start offering their sales product as as soon as possible. And as uh, they was missing uh, the expertise in this field, how to build the infrastructure, how to build the sales offering for the current solution we had a chance to to work with them and this was the, one of the main requirements why, why they chose us as as the partner in their journey to to become a SaaS product as well uh, then the next challenge here was that uh, due to the application limitations that the application didn't have any multi-tenancy capabilities on its level we had to think about how to design the environment uh, uh, to be dynamic so we are able to onboard and manage the tenant life cycle dynamically on the infrastructure level and we had to think about the isolation level for the tenant uh, um, next very important thing is that uh, we tried to um, prepare uh, the infrastructure for this SaaS offering, which is able to share as uh, most part of the infrastructure as possible. But on the other hand, we are able to properly isolate the tenants data and deployments. When we were thinking about those challenges and we did the assessment, we decided that we will use AWS EK as a common platform for all tenants deployments where we 
on where we are using the EKS um, or Kubernetes cluster, shared Kubernetes cluster for all tenants deployments. And each tenant deployment is separated um, via namespace or namespace based. Um, the shared part of the infrastructure is provisioned through the IOC tooling called Terraform because this part of the, inf of the infrastructure is a more or less stating and it's not dynamically changing based on the tenants man during the tenant management. So one new tenant is it's onboarded, offboarded, and then this part of the application stay the same and it's able to scale base, based on the uh, utilization. We call this process a sussification. Why sussification? Because we are trying to build a dynamic uh, infrastructure, multi-tenant infrastructure for the solution, which, which is single tenant base. So uh, it means that each tenant has its own deployment of the application with all the data separation. When we check the tenant lifecycle part here on the next slide, then we had to prepare the Helm chart for the application with which we deploy the application to the cluster. And uh, we had to take into account that each application deployment, or in other words, each Helm chart deployment required some infrastructure resources to be dynamically provisioned during the tenant onboarding. These infrastructure resources are mainly part like parts like databases, memory caches, file stores, and these resources we tried to bound to the application deployment and to the application lifecycle utilizing the cross-plane solution, which is um, the open source solution which you run in the Kubernetes cluster and it's giving you the possibility to, to to control and operate over the external APIs, and it's giving you the possibility to provision other infrastructure parts for your applications if it's required. For the dynamic tenant onboarding and offboarding process and um, upgrading, we choose the Argo CD solution, which is the open source solution on the market, who gives you an impossibility to uh, dynamically do the deployments of the Helm charts or other type of the sources to the desired Kubernetes clusters, and it's utilizing the GitOps pattern. Uh, each tenant deployment required other parts of the system to be automatically configured and provisioned, such, such as DNS records, SSL certificates, and secrets mounting. All those things we are, were able to manage through the other open source projects, such as external DNS for automated DNS entry management throughout the Kubernetes cluster, SSL certification provisioning with a third manager or external secrets operator for secrets mounting per tenant deployment. So, Let's maybe sum it up and uh, talk about the pros and cons of this fully isolated tenant solution here. So we had to ensure full isolation per tenant, as I will just repeat it, that each tenant had its own deployment and all infrastructure parts which are tightly bounded to the application were dynamically provisioned and this full isolation is giving us uh, quite a good security boundary within our infrastructure so this is one of the pros here and the different pros which i can mention are that um, client was able to define different level of peers per tenant and were was able to deploy even different versions of the application for tenants with this model and uh, the flexibility stayed for the for the tenant in in terms of the way how they provision and how they sell this product so the client still had the possibility to um to sell this product 
in the old fashioned way via the license model or offer the software as a SaaS offering. And we were able to fulfill the requirement from the client that we didn't make any application changes as they didn't have any capacity to start rewriting the entire software or parts of the software to become a more, more uh, uh, SaaS like or uh, introduce more uh, multi tenancy capabilities there. What, what could be the cons here within this setup? Uh, we can consider potential higher costs for the infrastructure as we take into consideration that um, each tenant has its own deployment and each application requires some resources uh, like memory and CPU and, uh, and some disk spaces and databases to run properly. So once you are not sharing this infrastructure, but you are uh, or the application, I'm not sharing the application for the tenants, you can end up with a higher cost in general. And this kind of a setup uh, is harder for the scaling because you need to take into account that you need to dynamically deploy the application per tenant, you need to dynamically spawn some infrastructure parts here. So those are things uh, we had to manage on our own and uh, automate that. So this is all in terms of the case one, and now I'm giving my word to Martin who will describe this case two. Thank you. Right, so uh, in our second example, uh, we want to show you a slightly different case and a slightly different approach. Uh, we worked with a company that specializes in biometric identity verification solution. And it's a pretty decent sized company. It's a scale up uh, that's been on the market for some time already. Uh, their solution is well established and it's used in uh, lots of places around the world and it's used on a pretty large scale. Uh, similar to the previous case, the company was offering the solution in a more traditional license model uh, and relied on their customers to install and maintain it themselves. Uh, the goal of the client was to provide the solution as a managed service here uh, to make it easier and more scalable for the client, which just didn't want to run the software on their own because it was too complicated and it like posed a challenge for them. Uh, in comparison to the first case, uh, here the client was ready to make multiple application changes and optimize most parts of the software to be stateless and multi-tenant. Uh, the core part of the application remains single tenant and required separate deployments for each client, which is similar to, to what we had in the first place. And our main challenge uh, as their cloud partner was basically to build a stable and cost optimized resilient platform to run this workload. Uh, the client developed several new services on top of the core components, which used to be sold as a licensed software. Uh, to accommodate, accommodate the needs of tenant registration and management for their clients. Uh, what's interesting is that they've also utilized a private CRM solution to manage all of the clients and make it easy for their internal team to handle all of the actions uh, necessary to operate the uh, SaaS solution that they wanted to introduce to the market. Uh, in addition to all of this, the client didn't really have a clear estimate of how much an infrastructure like this would cost uh, on a per tenant basis or even per request basis uh, in terms of operational cost. And this uh, really like affected the, uh, the pricing model that they wanted to introduce for their clients. So this was another challenge that we had to tackle for them. Uh, so we got to work and proposed a new solution for them uh, in a form of a partially multi-tenant SaaS, or usually this is called the bridged model of tenant provisioning. We build a stable and scalable platform for, for them to allow us to host the components and services of the solution that was the, the foundation that we started with. We ensured that all of the supporting components uh, and stateless parts of the services were deployed in a way that was resilient and scalable, uh, mainly to accommodate changes in the traffic volume, which the solution would frequently experience during large events where they would get a lot of user traffic from their clients. Uh, similar to the first case, we utilize, utilized AWS EKS along with other AWS managed services to run the overall solution. The other part of our work was to define a mechanism for provisioning the pertinent components alongside the 
to the rest of the solution. We design an integration with the client's CRM system uh, to automatically provision, upgrade, and deprovision the core component. Uh, in this case, we utilize the solution called Argo Workflows uh, to handle the tenant provisioning part. Uh, this model allowed us to simplify the overall complexity uh, of the platform and basically make it more cost efficient since most of the re underlying resources like databases and dataless workloads were shared among the whole solution. But it still offered the flexibility of not having to rewrite the core service to the client, which would pose a major challenge for them. And it would require a tremendous amount of effort uh, and time to do this. And one of the most tricky and interesting challenges uh, that came with the solution was creating a pricing guideline for the SaaS solution. I mentioned this at the beginning that the client didn't really have a clear uh, understanding of the operational costs on the platform, uh, and they needed this to basically price the solution for their clients. Uh, so we got to work, work again and came up with a solution. Uh, together with the client, we were able to create a load testing solution uh, that would tackle two problems at once. Uh, first of all, like it would test the stability of the platform, uh, but it would also help us to estimate the costs for a given number of requests to the system. Uh, the request flow was designed based on real user behavior and the system was scoped to a given size. So we, we tested it to its limit and like closely monitored the performance. And based on this, we could estimate how much user traffic can a given size of the system handle and correlate this uh, to the price of the solution. Uh, uh, we are monitoring things like data transfer, database utiliz utilizations, uh, the instances that were used in the cluster, and et cetera. Uh, and at the end, we came up with a guideline that the client could use and price the solution with the cost for running the platform in mind. Uh, and on top of all of this, uh, we wanted to offer the client the ability to provision the whole infrastructure platform for individual, let's say, premium tier tenants. Uh, due to the nature of the target uh, clients of this platform, uh, the overall solution pretty much had to offer this option as well. Uh, and since all of the infrastructure was defined using the infrastructure as a code principle and tooling like Terraform, Helm, and others, uh, it was pretty easy to for the client to set up a whole new infrastructure for individual cases and different environments or even different regions of the world and offer it to run it as a managed service for their clients. Uh, and to summarize it, uh, the client undertook the parts of this transition and rewrote some parts of the system to support multi-tenancy directly on the application level. Uh, we, as their cloud partner, we helped them to, to handle the overall infrastructure solution and provided an alternative approach to rewriting uh, of the core service. Uh, this approach uh, basically allowed them to significantly reduce the time to market of the solution and start uh, offering the SaaS product much sooner. Uh, and in the addition to, to all of this, we were able to free up the internal development team so they could be able to work on new feature development to module the first case. And by introducing a dynamic scaling of the stateless components, uh, it allowed us to run the platform in a cost efficient way. Uh, but also were able to handle major events with a greater amount of user and traffic with the platform would frequently experience. Introducing the connection between the CRM system uh, and uh, the tenant provisioning on the infrastructure level allowed us uh, and the client to easily manage the solution without heavy overhead of the platform itself. So we sort of created like an, another layer of abstraction on top of it. Uh, and at the end, we came up with a guideline that the client could use to price the solution with the cost for running the platform in mind. And now let's look at the first case, uh, which I'll again leave to Yara to describe. Thank you. So in the first, in the, in the case number three, we will um, uh, look on the pool-based infrastructure model, which we leverage for one of our clients. So first I describe the client um, situation before this before the uh changes he took with us 
uh, the client was offering the agent-based software, which provides a customer support. And uh, it's a large-scale company currently, which has uh, thousands of existing users already. And what is very important here to mention is that this uh, solution was already uh, offered to, to its clients as a SaaS offering, and uh, it's a fully multi-tenant application. So it was very ready to, and it was basically operating as a SaaS. But what was uh, the the issue here, which uh, the client faced was that he was running the solution on its own data center, and the solution was running in a very old legacy setup, which has a quite a big technical debt. And uh, uh, the client didn't have any uh, technical expertise here, uh, here and any capacity to started transitioning into some modern cloud native architecture. The overall tenant management was handled by the core CRM system as well and uh, or very similar like in the second case, which was described by Martin. And uh, the client was offering and running its, uh, its application uh, in a, and supporting its application uh, in a more versions and based on this um, setup they uh, have already started reaching some scalability issues and reliability uh, of the solution so the main challenges here which we had to tackle with and we had to deal with was that uh, we had to think about how to properly re-platform the old legacy solution into the new cloud native platform. And uh, during the assessment phase or during the uh, phase where we were trying to uh, think about the new cloud native solution, we had to take into consideration that this environment is very dynamic as it uh, operates thousands of users and there is quite a big scale about the users provisioning and upgrades um, at the same time. Uh, moreover, we try to really simplify the complexity of the old legacy setup, which was used previously to provision and handle tenant management process. So we came with a solution to use a pool-based infrastructure as the application was already uh, fully multi-tenant and it was previously uh, and by AIM offered as a SaaS offering. Uh, for this solution, we again choose the AWS EKS platform to run the, uh, to run the application and, um, sorry, And uh, uh, what is important here to mention that each tenant is represented by its ingress object in the Kubernetes cluster and within the pooled infrastructure, we are running pools of the application with different versions and routing to the corresponding application versions from the tenants or from the, in from the tenants requests is uh, uh, is configured on the uh, ingress level. Uh, then all requests coming from the tenants are able to be processed by the application itself as the application is fully multi-tenant. When we check the second slide or the next slide, we can see the um, high-level architecture of the solution where we have the shared pool cluster, uh, which is uh, reached by the all tenants or all users and within this cluster we are running the uh, pool of the application versions and based on the ingress configuration as I have already mentioned each tenant is landing on its um, desired application version which then process is uh, its request um, in terms of the data separation there are databases which are shared among the tenants and for uh, those databases the separation or isolation is made on the item level where each uh, entry with the database holds the tenant ID information and uh, 
this is like the data isolation layer which is very low let's say in terms of the tenants life cycle the client had the requirement to stick with the core CRM system to manage the tenant life cycle, onboarding, offboarding, and upgrading, as the scale of the users they operate is quite high, and it would be very hard for them to switch from to to other solution. This was one of the requirement. What changed? What changed uh, after we were able to deliver the new cloud native infrastructure for their SaaS product? was the integration part between the CRM system and the actual infrastructure. And for this, we use the Argo workflows, we, which gave us the ability to integrate and automate uh, lots of actions and activities throughout the tenant management onboarding and offboarding steps. Um, as we had to deal with the waste amount of changes which are happening over the ingress objects and database tasks, database tasks. And uh, we had to take into consideration that um, we operate like thousands of DNS records within the, within the zone management. So all those uh, aspects were able to be held by Argo CD solution, Argo workflow solution. When we sum it up and talk about the pros and cons of this pool-based infrastructure model, we can say that we stay the cost effective with this solution, which was one of the main requirements by the client. Why cost effective? Because we are sharing almost everything in terms of the infrastructure as the application is able to operate in the multi-tenancy mode, multi-tenant mode. And the, the solution is still scalable and uh, become more reliable in comparison with the uh, old legacy setup running in their own data center. And we prepare the base to for, for the client to have sustainable infrastructure, sustainable solution for the next development and enhancement. Moreover, we were able to stick with the old CRM system for man tenants management, which was one of the main requirements from the client. What could be some cons here uh, within the pool-based infrastructure model for the SaaS offering is that once you are uh, having a pool, to, uh, fully pooled infrastructure for your tenants, some neighbor or some tenant could become a noisy partner within your infrastructure and can cause um, some problems for other tenants as well. So we need to took into uh, consideration that we are sharing infrastructure resources for all tenants then that's why it's very important to um, have a solution with the uh, uh, scalability options and availability setup so this is uh, everything i guess from the case three and now martin can continue and sub sum it up okay uh so these are three different stories on how a company can make a transition to a SaaS offering on AWS. Each of, each of them was a little different. Each of the companies had a slightly different background, different challenges and different capabilities. Uh, in each case, we had to take into account the different aspects of the solution. In the first one, the main challenge was to classify the product without disrupting the development process and taking too much time from the internal developers. Uh, but also, uh, the company wanted to maintain the original license uh, offering al alongside the SaaS solution. Uh, as their cloud partner, we were able to fully offload this work and handle it by ourselves. We designed and deployed an infrastructure in a way that it was able to uh, fully handle the uh, tenant on and offboarding process uh, without changes, changes in the application itself. Uh, this significantly reduced the time to market for the solution and didn't pose any disruption on the, on the development team. Uh, in the second case, the company was already in a process of satisfying the solution. However, they didn't yet have the tenant on and offboarding process and also didn't have a stable platform to build the solution on top of. Uh, we were able to utilize the new by design multi-tenant supporting services of the customer solution 
uh, and combine them with a core service, which was single tenant in a, a bridged or partial multi-tenant setup. Uh, this allowed the company to run the solution without having to do major overhaul of the core services. Again, reducing the time to market by a significant margin and also providing a stable platform for them. Uh, in the final case, the customer was running a large scale SaaS with a lot of technical debt. Uh, the original platform outgrew its former purpose and wasn't really able to function properly in a sustainable way. Uh, the complexity of the tenant provisioning was insanely complicated uh, and everybody knew it had to be re redone. Uh, so we proposed a new scalable infrastructure based on EKS uh, with a pool based model where there were common pools of application replicas for handling user traffic. And we set up an integration with a customer CRM system, which was used uh, as a single control plane of the whole uh, solution and uh, handled all of the uh, tenant administration actions. And each of these cases have its similarities and differences. Uh, building a SaaS in AWS has many common challenges, such as figuring out tenant isolation context, uh, scalability, stable, stability, sustainability of the platform itself. Uh, and at the same time, each case uh, can be different, but uh, it needs a tailored solution. Uh, each of these companies were at a different state with different and different capabilities uh, of their own. Uh, our main impact as a cloud partner was boosting our clients with the transformation of their product uh, or existing infrastructure. Uh, the most prominent metric where this was visible was definitely the reduced time to market of these solutions. Uh, by having the ability to upload to have a listing on us and the infrastructure layer that we provided, uh, the clients were the clients were able to dedicate more time to the actual development of the solutions, and that ultimately lowered the overall cost that uh, was needed to get the SaaS up and running. Uh, under, undergoing the certification journey with a cloud partner can give you many benefits. And we, uh, Labyrinth Labs, Labs as a company, can not only provide the actual cloud infrastructure, but also help you handle key concepts and challenges such as tenant isolation, platform stability, uh, scalability, and tackle some of the less obvious challenges like tenant provisioning cycle, the overall cost stability and sustainability of the solution, and much more. Uh, we take care of the platforms we built, and if you choose so, we can also handle data operations as well, so you we can focus on the important things like actual feature development. We're also an advanced consult consulting partner of AWS with access to all of their funding programs, which our clients can benefit from. Uh, if you're struggling with any of this, don't hesitate to contact us. And if you have any questions, please free to, feel free to ask on Slido. We have quite some time to answer all of them. So uh, I'll switch over to Slido and let Laura handle the rest. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. And I'm happy that we also have some questions. So the first one from Raul is, is it possible to forecast the cost of different approaches? Yes, yeah, so, so, uh, definitely uh, it's been a challenge. Uh, it helps when you have a estimate of how your SaaS will grow, like how many customers do you expect within a given period of time. And this is a factor also when you choose one of these models. Uh, like, so the first case that we had, it was a smaller company where the growth was pretty predictable, like they expected to have, let's say, 50 customers per year. So we had a pretty good estimate of uh, how the SaaS will grow. And we we're also able to estimate the cost for like per tenant basis in that case. So it's it's possible to, to forecast the cost, uh, but you have to like have a pretty good guideline on, uh, uh, on the operational case or cost of the platform and your like expected growth as a, as a company or your user base. Okay, great, thank you. I hope this answered uh, the question. If not, then feel free to ask more. And so the next question is, what are the key factors you evaluate when choosing between silo, pool, or mix? Please elaborate more on this. Or do you want to take this? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. I can. I can maybe um, talk a little bit uh, or or try to answer this question. So, in terms of 
of the pool silo and or a mix infrastructure model for the tenants still uh very important to uh, to know which application you are going to satisfy or from which application you are going to create a, a SaaS offering. So what uh, what capabilities the application has and uh, if it's uh, able to handle some part of the multi, uh, multi-tenancy or it's a purely single tenant ap- application, this gives you uh, the starting point where you need to separate the data then the other key factors are data which are stored within the application. If those data needs to be uh, are sensitive data, are considered as a sensitive data. So uh, the, the clients needs to uh, really have uh, great separation and um, ensure great separation from the regulatory and compliance perspective as well. Um, the, the next things, uh, or key factor here is uh, the cost, because when we take into the consideration uh, those models, then the silo model is mm, most cost heavy solution as you are isolating uh, resources uh, for the uh, per tenant basis. And the, the level of the isolation depends on lots of requirements and uh, application state and uh, sec- um, some some compliance requirements so as much infrastructure as possible you can share within your solution is uh, is giving you the um the pros here to to be more cost effective yeah uh, maybe uh, martin if you can or you would like to add something here in terms of the key factors uh, around the evaluation you can uh, you can add. Yeah, I think I think the biggest factor, uh, at, at least at the beginning, is that if your application has some sort of a multi-tenancy concept or not. If it doesn't, and if you are not re- ready to make the changes, you sort of have to use the siloed model. Like there's not really another way of doing this, and you might require to silo the database as well and other parts. Uh, if you are able, or if you, if the application can already. Uh, handle multi-tenancy at the application level or if you can use a single database for example it might be a good idea to use a pool model or, or mix of those because those can be like less cost heavy let's say so i think this is the first first aspect that you have to take into the account okay perfect and then two more questions so you mentioned you used a AKS <laughs> in all three cases. Why do you use Kubernetes as orchestration platform? Okay, I'll, I'll take, take this one. Uh, we use DKS because it gives us, I think, the biggest flexibility options. Like the way we uh, provision tenants on the infrastructure layer, it means that we have to create some resources, like a new deployment, and also some supporting resources. And Kubernetes is a pretty good solution for that. Like it's pretty dynamic. You have a lot of flexibility options. It handles the scheduling for you and the scaling for you. So um, it's pretty flexible and you can do a lot of things in there. We also used a lot of the CNCF tooling and the open source tools like Crossplane, for example, which Yara mentioned in the first case and that basically allowed us to uh, define all of the resources needed for the application itself as a as Kubernetes object. And um, it turned out to be a pretty good and stable solution. Um, so that, that I think that was the main reason. Great. And how do you manage scaling of these uh, solutions? Maybe I can try to answer this question. So. Uh, scaling on the level of the infrastructure is uh, handled by the configuration of the, of the infrastructure uh, itself. So once uh, we are able to run the application with the EKS or Kubernetes platform, it's giving our the, the, the good place which uh, in which we are able to configure scaling uh, um, automation for instance with the cluster autoscaler or carpenter solution which is as well as some open source solution for the scaling of the infrastructure or underlying node running within the kubernetes cluster uh, for the database uh, 
for instance, we uh, have a possibility to use a managed solution, which are able to accommodate somehow, and uh, we are as well providing the observability and alerting solution for our SaaS or for our clients, um, based on which we can see the current uh, utilization of our resources and we can prepare for next Gaelic activities in terms of uh, or in the situation when the user base or client base is growing for this SaaS solution. Great. Um, and can I utilize serverless tech with your platform? We use Lambdas a lot. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, like our platform is sort of compatible, so you can extend it in a way like you can use serverless and Lambda stack as well. But th this mainly depends uh, on the application. Like serverless uh, and like Lambdas are pretty much tied to the application itself. So I don't think you would really be able to do this without a, re like a major rewriting of the application itself. Uh, so you can, but this like shifts the transformation to a fucking different level and puts some more load, I think, on the development team because they need to make much bigger changes to the application itself. Uh, on the other hand, like if you're starting a greenfield solution, which was like initially we had this discussion where uh, you can either go with a greenfield approach and you don't really have a lot of restrictions, uh, writing the application as a serverless application can be also a good a good approach to this okay and do you also work with other cloud providers like azure or focus only on aws i can try to answer here so we had also clients for which we built the infrastructure cloud infrastructure and help them to to migrate a solution within the azure as well but Primarily, we are working with the AWS, as it was already mentioned, that we are the AWS uh, uh, Advanced Consulting Partner. We are really focusing on the AWS landscape. But uh, as well for the future uh, activities, I think that we are really open to extend our services uh, within other cloud providers, uh, such as Azure or GCP. Yes, we have we have different projects. Like we also foc focus on Azure and then GCP. So if you have a case that you need to discuss, feel free to contact us. Perfect. And is it possible to create a cost-effective pool-based SaaS infrastructure with AWS ECS Fargate option, or is Kubernetes better? Okay. So. Uh, it's definitely possible. Uh, for us, EKS is a better option overall, and there are several reasons. Like, EKS offers you much more flexibility, I think, uh, with the tooling that you can use around it. That was also something that we discussed in some questions before. Uh, but also, I think you can make it more cost-effective. You mentioned that you like want to use Fargates, which is a good, a good approach, but uh, Fargates are much more expensive than yeah, running basically spot instances in EKS, which is what we usually do. And that's one of the easiest ways that you can make uh, the solution much more cost optimized. When you can use uh, things like spot instances, you can save like 50 to 60% of the costs for the like uh, node layer, let's say, of the solution. And uh, with EKS, we are pretty able, to, pretty much able to handle all of the downsides of running workloads on spot instances. Spot instances can mean that uh, the workload can be term terminated without, like, with like two, two minute notice. Uh, but uh, we can pretty much handle it uh, within the platform itself. So this allows us to run it in a more cost-effective way. But using it uh, in EKS is also an option, definitely. Okay, thank you. And can we get the recording of the workshop later? Yes, of course. We'll share it on our LinkedIn, YouTube, and I can also send it to you via email to those who signed up. So we'll be able to go through it again. Okay, so if that's all, 
if you have any more questions, please shoot. We still have some time left. Um, and if not, then we can slowly wrap it up. And thank you very much for joining us. We're happy that you spent this hour with us. And uh, if you have any more questions or would like to talk more, uh, be sure to contact us, um, either Martin or Yaro directly or through our website or any other means <laughs> or through our LinkedIn. We're quite uh, active there as well. So I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.